Well, welcome back to Outcast, beautiful OHO people. We're so proud to be bringing you episode four of our live stream about all things made with love by passionate people in regional Victoria. We honestly had no idea if we'd get past episode one, and here we are a few weeks later. But if you missed the first three episodes, well, we met a producer of some amazing infused honeys, a maker of some beautifully complex flavoured hot sauces, and last week we, we met the maker of some incredible um, bar, energy bars for everybody with compostable packaging. So by the way, thank you to everyone who's watched Outcast so far and a huge thanks to everyone who has gone on to purchase goods from OHO Markets or book an experience for later in the year when things open up or you know, in regional Victoria where things are opening up more quickly than we'd even hoped. So um, we're loving Click for Vic which is being uh, run by the Victorian government at the moment to encourage people to get out into our amazing Victorian regions virtually. So um, if, you've, uh, if you've got a moment, uh, look, look for hashtag click for Vic or even just go straight to the One Hour Out website and have a look for the, for the, uh, um, the products that are amazing, um, that are available from our amazing producers. So today on the show, we're talking to Tamara Newing from Boatshed Cheese and Tamara's Kitchen, Mount Martha. Um, Tamara, I have this quick question. Thank you for joining us first, but I have a quick question that I, that I, that I ask everybody. Um, well, let's start with Tamara's Kitchen, Mount Martha. That seems fairly obvious. Where did that, that name comes from you, clearly. Yes, well, it's actually, that's actually the newest name, if you like, in the stable. Um, I had a Tamara's Kitchen cooking school in Hawthorne, gosh, it must be 30 years ago. Um, and that's where I started teaching. So I had a cooking school in Taronga Road, Tamara's Kitchen, obviously, mm. just happened to be a, a logical name and it worked. Um, and then so I taught there for about uh, 10 years. Uh, and then we moved. I had five. I had two children when I started Tamara's Kitchen, five children when I finished. Five. Uh, ten years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my then husband sort of made a comment one day that um, – I, I was teaching so much sort of six days a week that I was missing out on so much with the children. And one of the things that I was doing in those days was teaching in France. And he came to work one day and said, I think we should just, you know, sell up here and move to France. And I thought he was being, you know, facetious because he doesn't actually like France very much. <laughs> but he wasn't. And uh, six months later, we I had sold that premises and we'd moved all our children to regional France in the south. And oh. we lived there for a year. Um, which was incredible. The kids went to school and learnt to speak French. And uh, in those days, I was doing a live weekly cross on 3AW for food. Okay. With great, with, uh, so I continued um, doing that. And, you know, it was just a fantastic um, evolving, if you like, of my food world. Mm. Um, and then after 12 months, we had to make a decision if we were going to be French or if our children were going to be Australian. And Australia won, so okay. we came home. Yeah, and... Um, then, after a period of time, moved down to Mount Martha and started to make cheese, which I'm sure you're going to ask me about yeah. in a moment. <laughs> I can't wait to get into the cheese. And then just very recently decided to expand the cooking school from just cheese making to other things, including sourdough. And so I needed a new name to encompass things more than just cheese. And so um, it just made sense, Tamara's Kitchen, Mount Martha. And it's amazing how many people who remember Tamara's Kitchen in Hawthorne have either contacted me electronically or by phone and said, but are you the same one? Because you've got a different yeah, surname right. and it's, it's Tamara's Kitchen. And a lot of them have come back, which is really lovely. What a great, like, like you know, um, it's kind of a great lineage for, for, for your own name to have even been international and then come back and here you are back at Mount Martha. Speaking of Mount Martha, yeah. I've got to ask, it is a glorious day here in the Yarra Valley. It's, I imagine it's just beautiful down there. How are things in Mount Martha with restrictions and COVID and oh. weather aside? Well, the weather's beautiful and I, I must admit, um, I never really understood the, the therapeutic value of water and a water view until we moved down here. Um, it is beautiful. The sun's on the water and we've got a lovely water view. So I feel very, very lucky and grateful to be down here. But we're, despite thinking that Mount, that the Mornington Peninsula was regional, <laughs> we found out during COVID, in fact, we're metropolitan Melbourne, so but we. not for anything. <laughs> I mean, we're, only, we're not metropolitan reason when it comes uh, not for post, a metropolitan not, not for Telstra, no, nobody else. Yeah. Nothing, yeah. nothing, except for COVID. Yeah. So uh, like everyone else in Melbourne, we're in stage four and mm. it's, um, look, it's been tough and particularly for the Mornington Peninsula, that's, we only have tourism and wine. Yeah. Um, 
wine, food and tourism and none of those are able to operate. So it's been, it's very tough, it's... particularly for restaurants and we've had to evolve. I've been doing sort of sourdough um, delivery boxes each week, which, you know, you've, you've probably yeah, seen on the Instagram. It's been very, very successful, mm. but it's, you know, and, and it's lovely to actually take something to someone in Melbourne and give them a taste of something special that they weren't expecting if it's a gift from someone. Um, so I love doing it. Mm. But, you know, we're all itching to get back to our real jobs. You know, for me, it's teaching and, uh, you know, I miss it terribly. I miss that contact and that ability to share the, no the knowledge and the love. Uh, I'm just going to remind the folks that they can ask to you all sorts of questions. We, we love hearing your questions, folks. Um, just uh, stick them in the, in the comments below and, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll put them to Tamara as soon as you ask them. Um, it is alive after all, uh, and uh, unless you're watching it back on One Hour Out's Instagram TV, so please ask your questions. We love hearing from you. So um, I have to I have to ask about Boatshed Cheese too because um, that's a pretty unique name. I mean, I I kind of put two and two together with your location and all, but tell us yeah. tell us about Boatshed Cheese and well, and, and the genesis it's, of um, that. Yeah, so it's not an ha it's not a happy genesis actually. Um, so when we came back from France, um, we had a sort of a couple of years of sort of resettling the children mm. into school and and our normal life. And for me, it was consulting and teaching. Um, and then my youngest of five children, my son Reagan, was killed in a scuba diving accident, oh, um, and he was fourteen. And in trying to find a way to deal with the grief and to see a road yeah. through that pain. Yeah. I did what I always do when I have difficult times and, and that's cook. And I started to make cheese because cheese was Reagan's favourite food. And wow. when he was, um, you know, I remember I have such lovely memories of him coming up to the fridge and saying, I'm a mouse, I'm a mouse, I need to eat cheese. <laughs> and, you know, when I made baked cauliflower or lasagna, he would be the last one in the kitchen with the, the sort of the baked on cheese and a fork scraping every last tiny bit off. So... The more cheese I made, the closer I felt to Reagan, and the closer I felt to Reagan, the more cheese I needed to make. Yeah, so um, I then had a problem because if anyone who's um, listening to this knows when you make cheese, you need to mature it in a fridge. And so I had a couple of extra fridges. I had them full of maturing cheese, and I couldn't make any more until I'd sold the rest. So I put the word out to friends and friends of friends to please come by and just get some cheese just to, to give it away. Um, and so I did. I had people come to the door and, and say, are you the person that's got the cheese to give away? And so I'd give people baskets of cheese and, you know, they loved it, of course. And I was just thrilled to give this little piece of Reagan's love away and then be able to have an empty fridge to make more. Um, and then the second time that this happened a couple of months later, again, I had very full fridges and someone suggested that I have a stall at the Little Red Hill Primary School Market okay. one Sunday. So I did that and I sold all the cheese in one day. It was incredible. And at nine o'clock the next morning, I got a phone call from Dairy Food Safety Victoria to say that I'd been reported for selling cheese. <laughs> of course. Um, so, I mean, I should have known better really, mm. but I wasn't, it wasn't a business and I hadn't really thought about it. It was just emptying the fridge. You've made some cheese so, and you, it's get, you're getting it to yeah, people. Yeah. Look, uh, yeah, it, it just was what it was. It was anyway. Yeah. So... Dairy safety were fantastic. They basically said, "Get a license, or we'll prosecute." Mm, okay. And um, so, but helpful in those nonetheless, terms, I, I imagine. They well, I, I mean, I was I was horrified mm. that I'd done something wrong, mm. but more importantly, I just wanted to make cheese because it was the only way I felt close to my son. Mm. And they said to me, "You know, if you're going to do the right thing, we'll help you every step of the way." And they were incredible. And six weeks later, I had a licensed premises um, under the house in what the previous owner had referred to as his boat shed because um, he had a yacht in it. So when we bought this house, he had a shed with a yacht in it and he referred to it as the boat okay. shed. So um, when Dairy Food Safety were there with the licence and they said, well, what's your business called? And I said, I hadn't thought about that and it wasn't going to be Tamara's cheese. Right. So I thought, oh, look, I don't know. It's in, it's the, in boat the boat shed. shed boat shed. That'll do. <laughs> That's great. And it should be a terrible name because there's so many T's and SH's and CH's and it's quite difficult to say, but it works down here, being on the peninsula. Well, it, it's um, instantly recognisable. And, and like, instantly. And how, how amazing, though. I mean, the weight of you know, loss and stress finds such a, a constructive, creative, positive outlet. Yeah. How beautiful that the outlet's affirmed by other people and, and you find yourself in a position where you're just, you, 
you know, you have to be licensed to distribute all of that positivity. Yep, yep. And, 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 you know, I must say that, you know, for the first four years we were in the boat shed mm. under the house and um, there, when we had our six monthly audits, the auditors would come and say they loved being there because it was the smallest, <laughs> the smallest licensed dairy facility in Australia but the one with the best view. Yeah, right. So you put a picture window in above the cheese draining sink so that you could see the water on a, particularly on a stormy day, which I always love. Um, anyway, so we were there for four years and really... For me, it wasn't a business. Mm. It was a labour of love. Mm. Um, but I was thrilled, as you said before, that people liked the cheese and, you know, we we won some awards, some really prestigious awards, both here and overseas, mm. which was incredible. And um, and the business sort of, without any intent, grew to be, um, you know, a well-respected maker of, you know, artisan cheese, so everything made by hand in sort of old French methods. Um, and then after four years, we moved to Dramana. We got too big for my tiny little cheesery under the house. Yeah. Um, and so the boat shed is used for teaching cheese making, which is a lovely genesis of it. Yeah. You know, it's sort of, it's evolved into the teaching area and uh, and it works brilliantly for that. Um, so, and boat shed, so what, the cheese making, Dramana. So. Well, one, one thing that you hear a lot as advice from, you know, well-meaning friends and acquaintances when you've you've got a passion and you're thinking of turning it into a business they say look don't turn your passion into a business but you seem to have turned your passion into something that's actually more of a greater passion rather than you know something you yeah that's just a business yeah i think maybe the i think maybe the reasoning is what makes this a little bit different you know i i love um i love clothes so I certainly wouldn't say my passion, but I wouldn't have a clue what people would want to buy. Mm. I, I would fail in every venture because I just wouldn't know what people mm. want to buy. Um, but I think that if you're passionate about something that you that your heart is in and it's not for a business, it's because you love it, people tend to be good at what they love. You know, you look at gym instructors. You rarely find a gym instructor mm. who just does it as a day job. They love it. They breathe it. They're so passionate about making people helping people become fitter yeah. and I think you know, I think when you start a business for something that you're good at and something that you just love it's hard to fail because I think people are drawn to that natural positivity and that natural um, um, love of something and for me it's cooking in general I mean I've, that's all I've ever done mm. I've only ever cooked professionally but um, and written cookbooks but for, for me the cheese it had something different. It had this very personal element. And I'm better at it now, mm. but for the first few years, someone in the class would always say, so how did you get into cheese making? <laughs> and it was a dreaded question. Yeah. I knew I'd start I My eyes would well up. People didn't understand why I was upset, you know. And when, they, when I told them briefly the story, it drew people closer and it made them want to share in that journey that is the cheese that I make in memory of my son. So I think um, now when people ask that question, I can talk as I did before about why I started making cheese. But Boat Shed's developed, it's, for me, it will always be about, about Reagan and the love of family and, you know, nurturing people through food, which is what I've, you know, I've, I've got a Jewish background. So that's what Jewish people do, sort of your birth, death, celebration. That's what hospitality is, is, isn't it, really? It's, it, uh, yeah, we, we forget that it's more than an industry. It's actually an act. Yes, mm. and and for me, I mean, it's a it's a lifestyle. It's a career. It's a passion. It's, you know, my children all had different um, careers mapped out for them. But after Reagan's accident, mm. they all gravitated to food, and now they all work in food, which is that was never the plan. But I think that in food, they felt they felt a connection to their brother who was probably the only one of my children who would have been in food had he not had his accident. Okay. So, yeah, so it's funny the way things things work. But, um, and, of course, you know, if you could change things, you would definitely change that story. But I've been, I think, incredibly lucky to find a way out of that grief and to turn it into something that's positive and, you know, I can feel those little sort of tentacles of love spreading around Melbourne and, and sort of, also around Australia, when people place an order online for cheese, I feel like that little bit of me and Reagan is going somewhere else. So it's, for me, it's a very personal journey. For many people, it's just about the cheese. But uh, it's lovely to have something that is that connects you to your customers. Well, sp speaking of, of Reagan's cheese, now I did, uh, I, 
because I'm a fan of the um, the the Mold Collective and and um, and their podcast, I know in advance a little bit about the Chelsea Blue, um, but I want you yeah. to tell me about that cheese. So <laughs> that's and that's an, another one of these. There's no intent and it just kind of evolved. So once I started. Well, once I had to turn the under the under part of the house into a cheesery, I needed a bank loan, so I had a mortgage, so it had to become a business. And so once it became a business, I wanted to have a cheese that was just for Reagan. Um, my uh, Reagan's dad started a foundation, the Reagan Milstein Foundation, and Reagan had always wanted to be a world famous soccer player. That was his aim. He wasn't very good, mm-hmm. and he used to say that he found it inexplicable that kids like him in the first world who had all the opportunity and none of the talent and there were children in third world countries that had all of the talent and none of the opportunity wow and how astute he, for a child yeah. so astute he was like that and very thoughtful and reagan always said that he wanted to do sports journalism to as a way of trying to even up this sort of unequal system and so after his accident we decided to do that in his honour. So the family started a foundation and we collected soccer boots from everyone who's got children has garages full of football boots and soccer boots that are too small. So we would collect those and rebrand them and clean them and recondition them and send them off by the by the um, container load to third world countries, to children in orphanages and in poor towns who were playing, you know, with... Um, plastic bags full of sand with bare feet and you know Reagan's dad then started collecting um, soccer kits and um, soccer gear and sending lots and lots of things that was his way of honoring Reagan but I needed to have my own way and so I wanted to name a cheese for Reagan and Reagan's great love is Chelsea Mm -hmm. And Chelsea Soccer Club or Chelsea Football Club my kids would kick me if they heard me refer to it as soccer um Chelsea um, Chelsea Football Club are known as the Blues, so it made sense to have a blue cheese for Reagan. And so I made a particular Stilton-style blue cheese in the very early days, and I called it Chelsea Blue. And, of course, only the family know that it's Reagan's cheese, and all of the profits from that cheese has always gone to Reagan's foundation. So that was my way of giving something back to, um, to Reagan and to children um, who want to play soccer but don't have the or football, who don't have the gear. Um, of course, when people would come to the market and they'd say, oh, Chelsea Blue, most of them thought it was named for the suburb on the other side of Frankston. <laughs> or for a girl. You know, yeah. we've got lots of girls that would say, oh, my name's Chelsea. I'll buy that one. And interestingly, we had lots of Manchester United fans who refused <laughs> to buy it because so it became a bit of a talking point, but for the family and for those of us that, you know, loved Reagan so much, it's just Reagan's cheese. And, um, you know, even now when I sort of make, you know, sort of make it, I often make it in the in classes downstairs in the cheesery, and I always feel a, a sort of a tearful moment when I make that cheese because it takes me back. It's 10 years this year since we lost him. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, there's still that very, very emotional. That's right there. Strong. Yeah. 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 It's just under the surface, Mike. You know, you scratch that surface and I'm just a bag of tears all <laughs> over again. Uh, well, I mean, you've brought me beautifully to um, your current focus, which is the workshops and the teaching. Um, and yeah. um, uh, oh, I've just had a great comment from someone who's uh, loved the football and cheese reference, by the way. Clearly, um, they're English because they've called it football. Um, yeah, <laughs> or else educated than me yeah. in sport. <laughs> um, so uh, tell, tell me what goes on at your workshops. Um, well, so I've taught I've taught cheese make, cheese and bread making um, for gosh it must be five years, and they're very small groups of a maximum of ten. Once we're all allowed to open up again, I'll reduce the class size a little bit so that we can keep things socially distanced. Mm-hmm. Um, but hands on, um, we make a French brie, uh, we make a fresh ricotta, and a range of goat cheeses, and then everyone takes their beautiful new baby cheese home with them to learn to mature it over the next few weeks so that in the course of about four weeks after the class, they have a perfectly matured brie that they have cared for and matured. And, of course, they have all the notes and all the the guidance. Um, The class includes a lovely lunch. And we also make a range of bread, not only because bread and cheese are so complementary, but because when you're making cheese, you have to wait for curd to set. Mm. So you may as well wait for 
rates to rise and curd to set and there's always something for us to do. And then when people go home in the afternoon, they have bread and cheese to take with them, which is oh, that's, such that a great That sounds thing. perfect. It sounds perfect. Look, yeah. uh, we, we've had a few simple experiences making um, our own cheese here. In fact, um, my eldest son made it, um, I believe his year 10 project was to make a series of cheeses and, and uh, from different milks and to see how they... That they responded and so on. So that was that that was that was great fun. Um, but, you know, I myself, I'm, I'm a big fan of making my own ricotta uh, because you just yes. should, right? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And if you and the first one of the things that um, it's probably the least interesting cheese in the class from students' perspectives until they see how how what it tastes like to make right. and how magical it is. Yeah. And once seen how magical it is they all say oh, i'll never buy it again i know right i'll just buy is so flavorless and when you make it it's so e delicious even, even the most basic of milks from the supermarket will make a superior ricotta absolutely absolutely so, i mean what, what advice do you give to that person who wants to have a go but is a bit intimidated by the process um, look, I think cheese making is intimidating. It is. I mean, it, lots of things can go wrong. The biggest problem with cheese making is you can't just buy your ingredients all from the supermarket. So, of mm. course, you can buy milk, but you can't buy rennet and you can't buy calcium chloride and you certainly can't buy the cultures that you need. So I think what most people do is they go online and they buy ingredients from somewhere and then they sit down and go, okay, now what? Mm. Um, and I would say that probably half of my students come to me because they were given a kit by someone. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> and, and it didn't work and they were disappointed. Mm. And so um, I've had people ringing up so often and say, look, I've got this kit and I've had a go and I, I'm a failure. And I say, look, you're not. But cheese making is something where you really benefit from seeing this um, – change from liquid milk into cheese that's happening literally before your eyes mm. and when you see it happen before you it gives you the confidence when you go home that you know what to do and you know the signs and you know what to look for and um i can't think of one exception of those people that have come to me and said i did it at home and i failed um every one of them has then gone home and sort of got in contact afterwards and said i've done it after the class and it works it's amazing and they feel so good about it and it's just it's seeing something happening and I think when you're in a class situation, which is one of why the one hour out classes or the, mm. the forum for buy, you know, for purchasing these experiences is so great, is that wine making and salami making, mm. they're all the same. There are little tips and tricks that you as an expert or you as a professional can share that might not be in the notes that someone's purchased. And that can be the difference between success and failure. And of course, that says, you know, there's something about being in a group situation with lots of questions from other people that they're probably wanting to ask too but didn't have the confidence to and someone else asks it and all of a sudden they go home with so much information and so much confidence and I think that's why those classes, particularly the hands-on ones, work so well. So um, somebody's asked a question here about um, about the type of milk that, that you're using and, um, and they've asked it in particular where they can get raw or unprocessed milk. And I know this is a well, big thing in the cheese industry, right? Like there's, yeah. there's a couple of camps yeah. there. Mm. Yes, that's a tricky one. So when I first started cheese making, raw milk was, um, it was available at farmer's markets as bath milk. Nobody was bathing in it. Everybody was drinking <laughs> or, or using cheese. it. Um, and then, of course, a few years ago, that became against that sort of outlawed and it was against the law to sell milk for mm. um, consuming. So it has a, an embittering agent in it. So it no longer tastes very good. Um, so the only way you can get raw milk these days for cheese making is if you know someone with an animal. Yeah. So, you know, no one is allowed to sell raw milk to you. So cheese makers are now, in fact, allowed to make mm. raw milk cheese. But the level of intrusion and microbiological testing into your processes is quite high mm. if you're using raw milk versus if you're using um, pasteurized milk and so I made a decision quite some time ago that we would not produce raw milk cheese because our output is so tiny mm. and if we have 10% up for microbiological testing we could never make a profit that's right <laughs> that gives your margin gone yeah yeah, yeah. and it's a small percentage and much less testing for pro for pasteurized uh, milk. So um, if you know someone with a cow or a goat, then you can certainly get some milk and have a go at it. And it, mm. it really is, makes a big difference to the cheese making process. Mm. But I didn't believe when I first started making cheese that um, you could make really, really good 
French style cheese with pasteurized milk, but you absolutely can. Mm. And one of the things that I teach is cheese making is an old skill. It takes time and it can't be rushed and you need to learn how to know when the cheese is ready to go to the next stage. And the cheese will tell you. Mm. You just need to look for the signs. Um, and like wine and salami making, those those old skills do take time and a little bit of knowledge, but you can make fantastic raw milk, well, fantastic cheese that tastes like a raw milk cheese with pasteurised milk mm. if you're prepared to put the time and the effort in mm. to just letting it develop its own flavours. And it's something you, you, you practice and your palate moves towards an understanding of, of the changes that you're making in your process and, and the way that changes your flavour too, which is, you know, true of all of those things that you mentioned, you know, all of those great, those great sort of particularly, you know, fermenting type skills and, and, and ageing and keeping skills. You kind of understand how this pro... And it, I always am amazed by winemakers and cheesemakers who age things for a very long time and have this, this exercise of extraordinary imagination right at the beginning um, where they go, this is going to taste like this in a very long time. <laughs> Well, that, and that is a challenge if you're a tiny producer. Mm. So most of the cheese boat shed that we um, that boat shed makes is young cheese, so fresh goat cheeses and soft cheeses like brie, mm. which are matured in about four or five weeks. And the reason is simply financial. We just can't afford to have tens of thousands of dollars sitting on a shelf for nine months. We need to sell it. Yeah. So our range is um, short maturation, but you know having to make enough blue cheese in January and February to satisfy a Christmas market in nine or ten months is a real challenge. That's and crazy, isn't it? Chefs, and chefs don't think of cheese as something that's taken nine or ten months. It's they sort of refer, it's almost like they think it's a cake. So <laughs> someone will go in November and say, I need cheese for Christmas and I want X amount, and you'll say to them, just think about your volumes because, you know, once it's sold, it's sold. And they'll say, no, 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 that'll be enough. And then they'll ring you in four weeks and say, oh, we've sold out. We need another 10, 20, 30 kilos. Well, it's not a cake. I just can't no. whip up another. But the what one a marvellous cake. That thought is fantastic. The one I make today, you have next October. Yeah, you, know? yeah. you, have, you have to have a bit of forethought and um, to think on your feet a little bit. Mm. Um, look, it's been – and look, having boat shed cheese has been – as, as I've said before, incredible for me because I needed something to give me my life back and Boat Shed Cheese mm. absolutely gave back my life. But um, I'd started to think about the fact that my body was showing signs of all of these years of carrying milk and turning cheese and, mm. you know, my hands and my wrists were sore and my shoulders were showing signs and I made a decision that it was probably time to hand the baton on to a fresh pair of eyes um, and I was very lucky to, to um, be approached by one of my, actually one of my cheesemaking students last oh, October. How good's that? Who, uh, it was just amazing. Who dairy farmers from Victoria, from country Victoria, who were looking to move to the peninsula and get into something in food. And, you know, the long, the short story is that they they made an offer to buy the, just the cheesemaking part of the business. And so on the 30th of June this year, it was sold to new owners. So I've maintained the classes and I consult to them and, you know, we still work a lot together. We're good friends. Um, but it's interesting for me to look at this this great love of mine which got me through the darkest period of my life and see it in a whole new fresh set of eyes in another younger family's vision and, and it's exciting to see where it's going to go, That's you know, so sort of. Uh, are they, are they one of, I'd been offered twice before to sell the business but um, – both of those were to non-Australian entities and I had a feeling that it would just become basically a sort of almost a, um, a brand, a production mm. um, well, and all the cheese was going to go overseas. And the, mm. the second time that, that happened, um, the gentleman that came to see me said, oh, but it's fantastic because we'll just buy everything you can produce and send it overseas. Well, I didn't want that. I wanted I need the to see people who, who demanded it from you in the first place and taking it to the farmers markets and having yeah. the same people come back every month and say I love this and I love that and what have you got that's new and then the people that have bought the, um, the cheese making side of the business have that same wonderful gentle attitude to feeding the people around them and it's so it's lovely for me to to now sort of put some more effort into the classes and expand that repertoire and sort of 
just out of the corner of my eye see what they're doing with this thing that I started, which is, um, you know, still so and will always be so much a part of my life. Well, I've, I've got um, I've got one last question for you tomorrow. Um, it's date night and I'm putting together a platter. Help me build the perfect platter. Do you dislike any cheese? I, I do not dislike any you cheese. cheese right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Neither does my date. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so, look, I always... You know, there's been a push over the last few years to um, to just have one star cheese, mm. one beautiful cheese and lots of accompaniments. I, I don't really conform to that logic because I like lots of different tastes and textures. So I always have a soft, oozy goat. Mm -hmm. um, it might be a lactic goat, so more like a chev, or it might be sort of a goat brie that's just about to run out of its um, rind. Mm -hmm. um, I might, um, and I would always have uh, some sort of rich cow's milk cheese. So if it was a fresh goat, then it would be um, a cow's milk brie and, of course, a blue. And for mm -hmm. me, that's always going to be Chelsea blue. Um, we do have, we do, Boat Shed does make a range of buffalo cheeses and one of those called buffalo blue is extremely popular. It's a lactic cheese, so imagine a sort of a chev-style mm -hmm. texture mm -hmm. but with a, an ir iridescent blue rind. It's a spectacular-looking cheese um, and it just, the, the um, high protein and the high fat in the buffalo milk helps the mould to grow quite quickly so you get this bright blue rind when it's very young. Um, so that one always looks fantastic. Um, and I think, you know, I think always a combination of shapes and colours is always very enticing. And then, of course, you know, you've got apple and nuts and quince paste and all those lovely accompaniments as well. I love a good but sourdough, I think it, like just, you know, thinly sliced and 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 um, just golden and from the oven that they're yeah. my crackers that's i love that if you just put that little bit of effort in to make that a little bit of salt and and that's it everything works yeah well actually it's interesting that you mentioned sourdough because when i started thinking about moving on from the daily grind of cheese making or the daily grind of turning 500 liters of milk into cheese and thinking what else i might do um like you, for me, the natural pairing of great cheese is a great bread. Mm -hmm. And I'd been making sourdough for a while, but I'd never quite – there was always this this missing – This it wasn't perfection. It was just not perfect. And it was nice bread, but I wasn't proud of it like I was with my cheese. And I will always thank COVID-19, okay. the first lot. Are you a sour – are you a COVID sourdough maker? I'm a COVID sourdough. Oh, but I'm at – well, I great. should say – the first, in the first lockdown, when we were shut down, I used that time to perfect my sourdough skills. So and I had two two or three weeks where I just baked every day and fed the starter differently with different things and measured the success or failure. And at the end of that month of the in, in April, I had a sourdough starter that I just loved. And I've been, you know, making sourdough ever since regularly and teaching sourdough um, then became the natural progression because people were saying, great sourdough, but will you teach? So, of course, we had, um, when I handed Boat Shed Cheese over to the new owners on the 30th of June, I had an absolutely jam-packed calendar with one-hour out classes. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then, of course, came lockdown yeah, number two. two. Yeah. So they've all been delayed, well, twice now. Yeah. And hopefully, fingers crossed, um, you know, they'll start again in the next um, eight weeks or so. Um, but, you know, all of the students that were booked into sourdough have very happily sort of moved their dates and I'm very grateful for that sort of support and loyalty. But, um, you know, teaching perfect. people what to discard and, and all different things to, to sort of sourdough things to eat with cheese, for me, that's just a natural pairing. Oh, well, look, thanks so much, Tamara. Don't forget, people, you, you can buy the Boat Shed cheeses at boatshedcheese.com.au and you can book a cheese no, at you... uh, boatshedcheese.com. No, so my apologies. <laughs> I, I just default. Yep. Boatshedcheese.com. Yes. And, and you can uh, book a cheese and bread making workshop with Tamara um, at our website, onehourout.com.au. Just click on OHO Experiences at the top. And look, Tamara, thanks so much. It's been such a pleasure to uh, meet and talk to you. And I, I just love talking to our passionate producers about, you know, what drives them. And, uh, and it's been such a, a, um, a pleasure to talk about my favorite food group on Outcast. I agree, absolutely. It should be it should be at the bottom of the pyramid. The biggest slice that we have should be cheese. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, beautiful Oho people. I hope you've enjoyed another little insight into what's going on with a passionate producer outside, well, inside the metro ring, just inside the metro ring. You're just, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> uh, but
but um, uh, make sure you like this video and follow our Insta and Facebook pages for more updates. Um, there'll be uh, links to Tamara's Instagram, both the Kitchen and Boat Shed Cheeses uh, at the end of this. And if there's someone that you think we should know about or feature on the on Outcast, please drop us a line from the contact link in our bio or just leave a comment below. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time on another with another passionate producer on Outcast. Thank you.